All right, so this is the traffic committee for the city of Mission Viejo, and I'm getting echo again, so uh, everyone please be sure to mute your microphones. This is the traffic committee meeting for the city of Mission Viejo for Monday, October 19th, 2020. This is an opportunity for residents to contact uh, two members of our Planning and Transportation Commission about various traffic and transportation related items. Uh, due to the um, stay at home restrictions, we are conducting yet another uh, online virtual traffic committee meeting. So all public participation is being done through uh, written comments that were solicited and uh, delivered to the city through our uh, website. Uh, so I guess first we can do our round of uh, introductions. We'll start with uh, city staff and then have our uh, commissioners then introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Brett Kennedy. I'm the transportation analyst for the city of Mission Viejo. I'm Philip Natiyama. I'm the traffic engineer for Mission Viejo. And Rich Schlesinger, city engineer for the city of Mission Viejo. Dave Lectus, commissioner. Uh, Cameron Nowry is commissioner. And uh, we had Deputy Coleman on, uh, and he seems to have dropped off, but he is our representation from the Sheriff's Department here. And then also we have uh, IT support staff on the line with us too to help us uh, with our live stream. Uh, so with the introductions done, uh, we can move on to our first item, which is the approval of the September 21st uh, minutes. So uh, if there uh, is a motion to approve or if there are any amendments, please let me know. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second that motion. Okay, then our uh, minutes are approved as presented. Um, so that takes us to the next item on our agenda, which is, uh, is a re request for parking restrictions on Via La Caruna at Castile Elementary School. And we have a very nice report already to go on it. Um, however, on Friday, we did receive this email from the principal at Castile Elementary uh, withdrawing their request. Um, I didn't get any formal written comments on this item. I did take a couple of phone calls asking about it, though, but no residents really um, provided an opinion to us one way or another uh, what they felt on it. So uh, that being what it is, uh, we can uh, leave this item as it is uh, with no changes, and we can move on to our next item. So... The next item is the marked crosswalk on San Rafael at Napoli Way, and Philip will be uh, providing that uh, staff report. All right, thanks, Brett. I'm going to share my screen. Let me see here. Okay, make sure I get the right one. Um, okay, so this is a request from Bathgate Elementary School. Um, the principal wanted to make some changes at the intersection of San Rafael and Napoli Way. So uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Give me a thumbs up, yes, okay, great. So this, is, this first exhibit is our vicinity map, uh, basically from the major intersection of Oso Parkway and Felipe Road. Uh, you head east and the first signal is San Rafael. If you head south on San Rafael all the way down, you're going to hit Napoli Way. And at that intersection, you have Bathgate Elementary School and Napoli Park. Uh, on this map, I put a red star on there so you can see where the school is located. And if you go to the next exhibit, uh, this exhibit has a lot of information, so I'm going to try to explain it. Uh, so the intersection of San Rafael and Napoli Way is on the bottom right. Uh, the school principal is asking for a uh, proposed marked crosswalk along San Rafael. So that's the request. The reason for the request is to allow uh, the TK and second grade students to cross this intersection here, walk along the sidewalk of the cul-de-sac, and end near the front of the school office, which is located 
on the upper left. So if you follow this yellow line, this is the pedestrian circulation path. Uh, today, uh, we don't uh, recommend allowing pedestrians to cross that leg because vehicles, when they're coming out of the cul-de-sac, uh, you know, they're making a left out. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor. So we've uh, made them go make a left turn out. Uh, this we, we installed a new sign last year and I'll, I'll show that exhibit in a minute. On the bottom part of this exhibit, this is where the third to fifth graders are walking. This is their walking path to school and they congregate near the playground area on the bottom left of the screen. And I also want to make a note that we have a crossing guard on the lower left corner of the intersection and they're crossing at Napoli Way there. So I'll have an exhibit that uh, makes this intersection bigger. So when I go to the next exhibit, so now we're zoomed in even more. This is our intersection location map. So as you can see here, um, what they're asking for is a marked crosswalk on this leg of San Rafael. And the reason for that, again, is for the TK through the second graders to be able to cross this intersection and walk to the front of the school office. And they're trying to separate um, the walking circulation path for the third to fifth graders, which is shown here in purple. Uh, now, again, uh, when the vehicles come out, um, we had a vehicle circulation plan to make them come out and make a left turn here. So I don't know if you guys recall, see this sign on the bottom left. This is last year. We installed a sign there for vehicles that they weren't permitted to go straight. And so they were, they were supposed to make a left during school day hours when they do their loading and unloading. So when the vehicles make a left out of Napoli Way, they, you know, they go up San Rafael here, and then the pedestrians were crossing in this direction simultaneously. So now, in addition to the proposed crosswalk that we're adding here, we're going to recommend to remove this sign because now the vehicles can go straight if there's pedestrians crossing there. So I, I just wanna make that very clear. There's, there's two things here. If we approve the marked crosswalk we're recommending to remove the sign as well. Okay, so then let's go to the next exhibit. So this exhibit is provided by the school. This is what they distributed to the parents. Uh, this exhibit is really more for vehicle circulation rather than uh, pedestrian circulation. So the cars are supposed to enter Napoli into the cul-de-sac if you're a TK to second grade and they go around the cul-de-sac and they drop off their students at this corner. If you're a third to fifth grade student, uh, this is the blue arrows, they enter the school parking lot and then they drop off their students by the lunch tables and then they exit out of the school parking lot and they exit out of Napoli Way. So again, the challenge in this school is there's one way in and one way out. It's on Napoli Way. Um, the, the school principal did mention on here, there's a sign that says adult walkers in red, and that was supposed to direct the TK to second grade, uh, parents that are walking their kids to school to go walk on the cul-de-sac. And then the walkers in blue, that's for the third to fifth grade students that are walking. They're supposed to go to the bottom half of the school to get to the entrance. So I just want to make that clear. And then um, the next intersection, I'm sorry, the next exhibit, this is uh, the top, okay, hold on, my computer froze, okay. So I have my, my street view photos here. So this approach is when you're on San Rafael and you're, you're going to the end of the cul-de-sac, uh, you have to make a left or a right turn. They're asking for a marked crosswalk on this leg. There's an existing stop sign there. Uh, to the right of this top photo is Bathgate Elementary School, and then straight ahead is Napoli Way. 
And then on the bottom photo, this is if you're going uh, straight on uh, Napoli Way or northbound, and you can go straight or make a right into San Rafael. So there's a stop sign. There's an existing marked crosswalk there. Uh, the school is straight ahead if you go into the cul-de-sac, and then uh, the Napoli Park is on the left. And then this uh, exhibit, the top photo shows when you're exiting out of the school parking lot. So this is uh, from the Napoli cul-de-sac. You know, you have a stop sign. And then on the far right of the top photo, there's that sign that we installed last year. Uh, so the vehicle exiting out of Napoli, they can go straight or they can make a left. On the left of this photo, you could see that we only have a, a limit line for a stop sign for vehicles and there's no marked crosswalk there. So that's what they're asking for is uh, two yellow lines um, on this leg to the left. And then the bottom photo shows the sign that we installed last year. Um, if we approve the marked crosswalk on San Rafael, uh, we're recommending to remove this sign as well because of the vehicular and pedestrian conflict. Um, so they can now go straight or left if that's the, the route of the pedestrians. All right, and then uh, this exhibit, our intersection turning movement counts that we took last year in September. I don't know if you recall that we were trying to make all of the vehicles make a left turn instead of a through. Um, I have some green squares here. It shows in the morning there were 193 cars making a left turn coming out of the cul-de-sac. And then in the afternoon, there was 109 cars uh, exiting out of the cul-de-sac and making a left. And this is this data is before we installed that sign, the no through movement sign. So I wanted to make that clear. And then this is a attachment for, this is pedestrian counts. So this red square shows, let me make this bigger. The south side, this column is the south side where the existing crossing guard is. And these are the number of students and parents crossing at different times of the day. It's one in the morning and one in the evening. So at its peak, there were 136 people walking in the morning and 183 people walking in the afternoon. The next column over is the east side, which is the existing location or the leg on San Rafael where the principal is asking to create a new crosswalk. So as you can see from the past, there were zero pedestrians crossing there, but we're trying to change that now. So um, just to recap, um, let's zoom out here. this is our proposed yellow crosswalk markings on San Rafael and its intersection with Napoli Way. And in conjunction with that construction, we will recommend to remove that sign that we installed last year that's restricting the through movement for vehicles. And then when you zoom in on an intersection level, this is what it's going to look like. If we're to approve it today, we're gonna to create two yellow lines, which is a marked crosswalk, and then we're gonna remove this existing sign here. And then here is the initial letter that we received from the school staff. Um, basically, they're indicating that due to COVID-19 and our reopening plan, it is necessary to have two different points of entry. The kinder to second grade will be walking in on the sidewalk in the cul-de-sac in front of the school, requiring them to be on the opposite side of the street. We have done this in the past. Grades three to five will be coming in by our MPR, which is on the parking lot side and also coming in on the Napoli Park side. We have to keep distance as much as we can for all our students. I hope this information makes sense. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. So that concludes my presentation. Um, I'm open to any comments or questions from the commissioners. Yeah, I, I got a question. Does the uh, principal know that you want to remove that that 
uh, but you want to change, you know, move, remove the sign and change that direction thing. Yes, we uh, we've communicated via email, and I've informed uh, the principal that that would be my recommendation to the traffic committee is to remove the sign if we create the new marked crosswalk. To, to me, it seems like it's not the best way to do this, all right? I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with this school. My kids both went there, and I'm familiar with the crosswalk. And it seems like the, the principal wants to do this because of COVID, and we want to keep students away from each other. So now what you're doing is you're, you're having children all over that intersection crossing both different ways and uh you know now you're separating the third graders in first second and, or kindergarten through whatever go here now the older kids go here and generally uh parents have the older children walk their the younger children to class okay that's usually the way it's done not always but i know a lot of families will have a neighbor you know hey you're in fourth grade will you you know you're you tell your kindergartner you're going to be walking with, you know, little Billy. He's in fourth grade. And, you know, Billy, make sure they get to kindergarten and make sure they get to class. Now the school wants to separate them. All the third and fourth graders go over here or fourth or third through fifth and kindergarten through two or whatever it is. Go here. To me, it doesn't sound good. It sounds like, uh, you know, something that that is happening because of COVID. But I think the overall picture is not a safe one you know now you've got two intersections cars going every which way if the priority is safety for the kids this choice doesn't seem like it would be uh the right one but i i would defer to cameron he knows you know how how accidents happen and i mean whatever i'm, I'm not locked on this but it just doesn't seem like the best safety choice for for kids and like i said that you've got to at that corner now you've got to separate the older kids that always walk to school with the younger kids because this is only uh talking about kids that walk to school am i believe i'm right because the if you're being driven by your your parents or saw a carpool you're gonna drive right through that intersection so this is just the kids to walk to school you're going to be separating at the corner. Okay, bye. You go over there. No, it's okay. Go ahead. I'm over here. No, keep walking across the street. Just sounds like a mess. I think, you know, the way it is is fine, but that's, I have no other comments on that. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Nauer Hayes. Uh, I think you're on mute. Um, it's like, yeah, there you go. Okay. Gotcha. Sorry. My fat fingers. Uh, Dave's got some really, uh, legitimate points. Um, ultimately the, the, the stakeholders that are going to get the brunt of this decision is the sheriff's department. So, uh, a couple things I'd like to hear from deputy Coleman and also like to know if this was, this was obviously presented to the sheriff's department before, before this meeting. Uh, what they feel about it. Uh, they're going to get the traffic complaints, they're going to get the TCs or the traffic collisions. Um, what are their thoughts? So, sorry about that. My is having te technical difficulties on the computer, so I have uh, the phone up now. Um, I actually went down and spoke with the principal this morning about the issue and the, uh, the conflicts with the sign and putting a crosswalk in. Um, I think it's a good idea but not at the same time because you're going to have the same traffic issues as before but from what I took from the principals now that since there's this COVID thing to where the parents aren't allowed on campus it's creating an issue for cars you know entering and leaving the actual school so I, I think it's a good idea but not I, I would say keep it as it is but it, just the design that they have going on with the whole COVID schedule and the precautions it's 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 a mess right now to be honest uh deputy did the principal seem to indicate that this was being driven at the district level at all or parent driven or it was just just an idea that they were spitballing 
um, off bus? I think it was more of an idea. Um, she didn't mention anything at a district level or anything like that. Um, she was more concerned of the safety of the people crossing the street. Since there's no actual crosswalk, she was telling me the crossing guards are having to kind of do double duty and dart out when people start to leave the sidewalk area to cross over towards the actual painted crosswalk section. But again, I mean, unless we take out that sign, you, you're going to go back to square one with the, the traffic concerns and the backing up of people wanting to go straight or make a left. It, it's it's just a bad location to have that intersection, to be honest. It would almost be, I'm looking at it on the map right now. I talked to Dixon about this. I don't know if it'd be feasible. It'd be very costly, but to have a road placed from Philippe over to Napoli Way, and then totally eliminating the sign that's there would help with the uh, entering and leaving of the school. But the traffic issue is only during school times. So I don't know if another crossing guard would help with this issue if they had two posted at Napoli and San Rafael, or if creating another exit point or entry point, either a one way or two way from Philippe. That's the only other thing I could think of. Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to comment on that um idea really quick uh, i'm going to bring up this exhibit right here again as you can see here so i think deputy coleman was referring to the cul-de-sac on napoli way where it ends today uh, there's actually a drive aisle in the back of the school that goes around the perimeter of the school uh, deputy coleman was referring to extending the cul-de-sac of napoli way to go straight and touch Felipe Road right here, all the way through. That has been reviewed in the past and it was uh, infeasible because of the grade difference from Felipe Road to Napoli Way. Um, there's a, you know, there's a certain grade that you can go down and the distance from the grade on Felipe Road to the grade on Napoli Way is too great of an engineering distance, it'd be uh, basically like a 10% you know, grade downwards, and then you'd have to move all the soil. And uh, I don't I don't even know who owns this portion of the slope right before uh, that ditch right there. So um, that has been talked about in the past, but because of the grade differential, it was deemed infeasible. Um, but you know, if there's another option uh, to, to fund that improvement, we could definitely consider it. But at this point in time, we don't have that option. Um, and then uh, Deputy Coleman indicated the this intersection, again, is, is challenging because it's one way in and one way out only. It's the only way that cars can come in and come out, as well as pedestrians. And it's it's not a big intersection. It's, it's a very small intersection. And so uh, that's why there's a lot of vehicle uh, congestion when school is uh, starting or ending, there's a lot of cars trying to come out at the same time that there's a lot of pedestrians walking at that intersection. And so that's where the, the challenge lies. So I just wanted to make that comment. Uh, Deputy Coleman, is the school historically, or did they talk to you at all about their own internal traffic management plan um, with how they move the cars through the parking lot, um, staggering drop-off times, and if they did, are you pleased with what they're doing? Did they involve you in that or did they just drop this on us? Have they tried to mitigate everything on their property before they, they went to us? I don't think that they've you know released some sort of a traffic plan, at least to the sheriff's department. Um, today, again, was the first time I actually went and spoke with her for this particular reason, because we do enforcement at that intersection because people We'll, we'll sit there right in the middle of the intersection and people will just try to drive right around us to continue straight onto Napoli. Um, but again, I think it's kind of a weird time right now with the COVID schedule because people are being dropped off and picked up at different times. They have different assigned areas for pick up and drop off and par parents aren't allowed on campus. Yeah. So it's maybe yeah, I, we didn't really go yeah. over any back plan so, or anything like that. Okay. Yeah, I, if 
Dave doesn't have anything else. I could kind of tell you where my head's at. Um, I would, I would like to see this play out first and not make any changes. I'd like the school and the sheriff's department and the city to maybe collaboratively really look at the footprint of that property and those parking lots and stagger times and, and make sure that we've done everything we can uh, to mitigate the flow of traffic. Let school start up, see how it shakes out. Um, you'll probably pivot after, you know, a few months and, and maybe come back to us after a few months and say, Hey, you know, we, the crosswalk, crosswalk thing wasn't an issue, but Hey, we saw this issue or, Hey, keep the sign. I, I think they're trying to do a good thing here and anticipating what's going to happen. But, um, at, at this point, I wouldn't make any changes. I, I'm not completely convinced that it needs to be done right now like that. Okay. Um, I, I just had one quick comment. Um, you did say uh, return in a few months. Um, traditionally, when we review a traffic committee item, we, uh, we do a moratorium for a year. Okay. Um, so I don't know if that's in line with what you had in mind for a few months. Are you thinking shorter than a year or? Well, let's, let's find a workaround to that. These are, these are all times when we, we, have, to, okay. we have to, like I said, pivot and, and, you know, the whole idea of, of staggered times and hybrid schooling has never been thought of, you know, and, and this is all stuff we're trying to, to work with, um, you know, and I use my own experience, you know, my kids are in private school. And the traffic plan has changed three or four times here in the city of Mission Viejo, but they've made it work. And each time it's been improved. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm really suggesting, even if they have to come back uh, and reword their request somehow or, or something like that, um, I just want to see it play out more. I'm just not into changing the landscape and environment on that without, you know, really seeing the impact of it yet or, or seeing, seeing it in real time. Okay, um, I'll, I'll put in the notes then that maybe we can come back uh, in a range, let's say between three to six months so that we can come back to the traffic committee sooner if there's an issue or if we come up with a better plan. Yeah. Uh, how's Lechnis, that sound? Yeah, it, it, if Commissioner Lechness feels uh, also, I'd like his support on it. And we, we also have to keep in mind how many schools we have. This, this could right. be the new trend at every traffic committee meeting is, is the schools coming to us to solve their their newfound traffic uh, problem? So um, that's that's another thing I'm thinking of. I really want to put it on. I really want the onus on the school and the district and the parents okay. and and all those stakeholders first before it's hey, uh, Cameron, Dave, and staff, you guys solve our problem. Okay. Yeah, and I, I agree. And maybe you could even ask uh, Philip. Uh, are there, or maybe we, you already know this, are there other schools that separate children at an intersection, you know, by age group or, or, uh, or class? I mean, I mean, maybe that's common. Maybe that's what the district does to all their schools. Sounds unusual to, to me, but maybe they're all, that's the new, uh, the new norm now. But if they're not doing it, if this is the first one, you know, that uh, where they're separating the, the kids at the intersection, um, you know, we just don't think it sounds, sounds right. Okay. Yeah. So this is the first request that I've had to separate uh, the kids, uh, two different school locations for the same school. Um, I have not heard of that yet. So this is the first time. Um, I do know that each school does have a hybrid schedule and they've all changed their schedules, you know, trying to accommodate the COVID-19 situation. Um, I also know some schools are, are offering a hybrid uh, class format where it's in person versus online or or all online or or all in person. So they've uh, accommodated that request as well. Um, when I was presented with this request, I know that the idea was for COVID-19 safety and to separate uh, set different grades on different locations of the school. Um, my initial thought was, um, you know, some schools aren't able to do that. Some schools don't have a sidewalk on both sides. So I was under the impression, you know, that the CDC guidelines was to maintain six foot distance between people. 
So if that was the case for, let's say, for example, there was a school that only had sidewalk on one side and they couldn't separate pedestrians, well, they just have to be six feet apart. So uh, I, you know, provided that, the, that reasoning to the school staff, um, but they still wanted to separate uh, the students on different sides of the street, uh, regardless of that CDC guideline. So uh, that was some of the history of the email correspondence uh, with the school staff. But um, what I'm hearing from both commissioners is to, to keep the intersection operations as is and uh, discuss or work with the school, work with the school district and the parents going to the school um, if there's a, a consensus to improve the, the planning so that um, the, the intersection operates a lot better. Um, is that an accurate statement? Yes, okay. All right, sounds good. So for the minutes, um, Philip uh, tossed out the idea of returning this to the traffic committee in three to six months. So is that going to be our official action we take on this? Is that we're going to continue to monitor and report back in three to six months? Well, when do they start? Do we know their, their start date? or they, they They've started. They're uh, two or three weeks into their session already. Yeah, I believe they started the last week of September. Okay. So. Yeah, and historically, whenever uh, the schools start up, you know, during well, what used to be normal years, uh, we would kind of have a moratorium on making any changes for at least two weeks because it takes that long for the traffic patterns to normalize. And I think the previous item that the school withdrew their request on, it, it, it's a good uh, representation of that, that, you know, they try one thing and then as they get their real world experience with it, they may find a way to work around it without having to involve the city. And I think there's definitely a possibility that could happen here too. So I think it's a good idea for the the waiting period to, before we go making a permanent change for what's a very fluid situation and how the schools are handling their arrival and dismissal times. Yeah, I want to clear. I want to clarify that uh, school started. Uh, I think it was late August, but that was remote or distance learning. The in person class learning started in the last week of September. So uh, I just want to clarify that. I think three months is prudent if, if we could, I don't know what the terminology is, if we table it or whatever, come back in three months. And um, it, you said it very eloquently, Brent. Uh, we'll take a look at it then. Okay. Okay, yeah, then um, in that case, yeah, the, the official language will be something to the tune of, the committee directed staff to monitor the location and to report back in in three months then. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. It is my turn to present uh, parking restrictions on Bridgeton between Baronet and Camden. So I get to share my screen again. Go for that and we can move over to the next tab. All right. So uh, this item comes to us at the request of uh, some new homeowners in the Auburn Ridge community, which is seen here uh, on the screen. Uh, Auburn Ridge is located very close to our previous item at Bathgate Elementary School, uh, located uh, directly off Felipe Road between the intersections of Camden and Barbadanes. So uh, there is a bit of a history here. Uh, so Camden is one of our collector streets that um, has on-street parking. There was a big discussion that took place about 10 years ago. Uh, previously, Camden only allowed on street parking on one side of the street and that was on the side that was adjacent to the mosaic apartments and to the emerald point condominiums and the demand for on street parking was pushing up into the neighborhood on bridgeton baronet and even the the far south end of ashford and so the city 
uh, uh, put in a no parking midnight to 5 a.m. restriction on parts of uh, Bridgeton, Baronet, and Ashford. And then later uh, opened up the slope side of Camden for additional on street parking to uh, relieve some pressure for the on demand uh, or the on street demands for uh, parking in the Auburn Ridge neighborhood. So this is the location specifically that we're looking at. Um, our resident here uh, is citing the um, typical issues of cars that are being parked there and the motorists who leave their cars there uh, are leaving trash and other items in the area and they uh, would like to see better enforcement and uh, for there to be less littering going on in the area. They have have all the typical concerns that uh, this type of activity uh, is detrimental to the neighborhood and their house value and that kind of stuff. And we have their complete request uh, at the end of this report. So we'll uh, show you the full text at that time. This area is part of that uh, no parking midnight to 5 a.m. restriction. That's these dotted red lines. We have the uh, legend down here. Uh, the last house on Baronet is the resident making the request, and we have the solid red line showing where there's a request for no parking anytime, and then the uh, the two red dots indicate where the uh, no parking, uh, the signs for indicating the no parking restriction, where those would be located. Uh, there was uh, some discussion in the public comments coming up about the safety for vehicles traveling through the area. Uh, Camden is 40 feet wide in this location, so that provides adequate space for there to be parking on both sides of the street. And uh, we have some other information down here. Uh, we did our three year uh, collision history based on collisions that are reported to the Sheriff's Department, and there were no reported collisions from 2017 to 2019. Uh, if there had been anything more recent, which I haven't heard through from any of the residents I've spoken to, uh, that there have been any recent collisions out here, but uh, those just wouldn't be captured yet because uh, it takes time for the, the report to go through the process and show up uh, in our data. The last bit of information I have for Camden is that it does carry uh, about 2,900 vehicles a day, and that data comes from our 2017 speed limit update that we did for Camden. Uh, we also conducted a parking survey in the area to look at uh, any potential impacts from uh, eliminating the parking in what would be zone A on our parking study here. Uh, so here's the chart showing the, the demand for on-street parking. And well, it, it looks like the you know none of the locations are ever at or above capacity, but it does look like there's still some parking going on there uh, during the overnight hours, even though that is uh, restricted. And the residents have requested some additional enforcement on that to uh, get some better compliance out there. But we do have to be concerned, even though uh, location A in the capacity segment only contain only can hold up to three vehicles. If we take away the parking there to be no parking anytime, that parking demand doesn't go away, but instead it gets displaced uh, most likely further up in the neighborhood. So we do have to be mindful about taking away on street parking that it doesn't make the cars magically go away. It just makes them go someplace else. So here we have uh, street photos of the location. This is on Bridgeton, uh, looking north uh, on Camden, uh, looking on Bridgeton, looking north. Uh, this is Bridgeton, uh, looking the other direction. Uh, the truck you see would be in the location where uh, the re we have the request for no parking anytime. Uh, this is another photo looking uh, north from Camden uh, so that the vehicles parked on the left-hand side there would be 
unable to park there if the request for the no parking anytime restriction is approved. And this is a photo looking down Camden. You can see there's uh, on-street parking demands for both sides of the street. And finally, this is the intersection of uh, Baronet and Bridgeton. Uh, finally, we have our uh, original request. Let me see if I can move this so I can see all of the text here. All right, uh, so the original request reads, uh, we are excited new homeowners in Mission Viejo. We returned to the city after college to settle down and start a family. And we feel fortunate to have purchased our first home this month. Uh, our home is located in Auburn, Auburn Ridge community on Baronet. Uh, in the short time we have owned our home, we have had major concerns regarding parking enforcement where there are already posted restrictions. These concerns not only impact our home, its value, but they also greatly impact the environment because of the parking issue. It comes hand in hand with large amounts of trash discarded by the car owners. All their daily discarded trash falls into the large open storm drains that, that stretch from the curbside to the corner of Baronet and Bridgeton, uh, directly in front of our home. And on the side of our property along the curbside from at the corner of Bridgeton and Camden. Uh, we found we can't keep our windows or front door open because people stand by their cars at all hours and smoke, then drop cigarette butts in the gutter. Uh, yesterday, the cigarette butts also accompanied uh, two pink condoms, uh, some foil, and other fast food containers. All of this garbage wash garbage washes directly down to the storm drain as soon as someone up the street runs sprinklers. On Camden, there is a large amount of garbage discarded daily directly under the sign that, that reads, keep our neighborhood clean. The sign that the, sign that the current parking signs tell us uh, is that Mission Viejo has acknowledged that this issue before without success or resolve. The current parking restriction on the posted signs is no parking from 12 midnight to 5 a.m. Our fear is even if this middle of the night enforcement was happening, that wouldn't mitigate the daily haul of trash that washes out to sea from the cars that come and go all day using the curb uh, to hide their nefarious behavior, hence the pink condoms. Uh, we initially just started picking up trash ourselves, but that is futile we, and we feel it needs to be professionally addressed. We are not comfortable with confronting people ourselves as this could cause people to retaliate against us and our property. It's time to get tough as new residents who care about the environment, health concerns with the disgusting nature of the trash and property values for all Mission Viejo. We would appreciate if the city uh, of Mission Viejo would paint the curb red on Bridgeton that flanks our home and enforce the existing no parking rule across the street against the, Ar the Arroyo on Bridgeton and the parking restrictions on Baronet too. It would also be helpful to add garbage can at a garbage can and dog waste dispenser near the public works building on the corner of Camden and Bridgeton in order to make the cleanup and trash mitigation easier, just a thought. Ideally, we would also appreciate if uh, resident permit parking only can be enacted on Baronet. I think this could be agreeable with the Auburn Ridge Association as well, who is also CC'd on this email. Permit parking works very well for the residential area near Mission Viejo High School. And uh, I have reached my three minute limit on public comment, so we'll cut it off there. Um, one thing to be addressed with the request for permit parking is the locations where we have that in the city is uh, restricted to areas around high schools where you have students coming in from outside the neighborhood and parking their vehicles in the neighborhood so that they could attend class. The city has never implemented a permit parking program where it's other residents parking in a residential area. Um, so uh, that's not something that the city has uh, historically considered to be an appropriate use for uh, a uh, permit parking program. So with that, I also have uh, five public, five or six public comments, but we can stop here f and if there are any questions about the presentation so far. All right, then I can continue on. Uh, and 
me get my timer started here again. All right. Uh, comment number one. Good afternoon. My name is Allison. I'm a resident of Mission Viejo. I would like to discuss some points about the parking restriction request made for bridging between Baronet and Camden. It is important to understand the difference between requesting a new restriction on parking and enforcing current parking restrictions. As a property owner who pays their fair, who pays her fair share of property taxes to the county, I find it illogical for all homeowners to pay for general costs of road maintenance, uh, repaving, street sweeping, etc., but then be restricted on which public roads we are allowed to park our vehicles on. It is my understanding that permits would not resolve the the parking concerns because the Auburn Ridge community, the Mosaic Apartments, and Emerald Point condos are all considered residents of the community. Thus, everyone would be eligible for resident permits. I understand there may be an inconvenience to some local residents to not allow restricted to not allow restricted parking, but I would like to look at this issue logically and fairly. Uh, then we have a couple subsections here. Uh, discarded trash. While I agree that there is a good amount of trash left in this specific corner, I do not see how permanently restricting parking would de decrease the amount of trash since the corner is rarely, if ever, patrolled during the day. Uh, stripping residents of the right to park their vehicles outside of the existing 12 a.m. to 5 a.m. restriction would be going for, uh, too far to address a simple trash issue. Uh, smoke, there is nothing stopping a vehicle from parking 10 feet away on Camden or Baronet legally and walking towards the gutter on Bridgeton to toss their cigarette butt. It's unfortunate, but the terrible scent of tobacco is not enough to completely alter parking restrictions of a neighborhood. Uh, resolution propositions. Uh, take no action. As outlined above, there is no real need to restrict parking on Bridgeton. Uh, trash and smoke inconvenience is not a suitable reason to fully restrict public streets from very sorely needed uh, residential use. Adjust the restriction time and or increase patrolling. I do not disagree that there is a number of vehicles parked in the area with the within the restricted 12 a.m. to 5 a.m. timeline and have in fact witnessed a few sleeping drivers, but the problem is not the zoning of the restriction. The issue is that the existing restriction is not enforced, perhaps updating the restriction time to 10 p.m. to 5 p.m. would uh, mitigate uh, the level of trash being left behind at the late hours. We could also increase patrolling by once a night. Uh, we can ensure that no nefarious acts are occurring and as a possible result, increase funds by issuing tickets when necessary. Uh, install trash receptacles. I do acknowledge that there, uh, there is plenty of trash left behind in the specific corner. However, I do uh, not believe that restricting parking will resolve this issue. All right, uh, and that is my three minute limit on this comment here. Uh, comment number two, oh no, this is comment number, th number three, I think. All right, I may have misnumbered these. Uh, the issue of parking along city streets of Bridgeton, Baronet and Camden is not a new one. Uh, valuable resources, city time and money included were used in coming up with a compromise plan several years ago that also involved a review of municipal codes and other legal issues, which required numerous public hearings. To request alterations to the plan by an ill-written letter accompanied by gratuitous pictures is ludicrous. To suggest resident permit parking only for Baronet shows little concern for any other residents within the immediate community as is the request for a private no parking zone along Bridgeton and Baronet. The photographs provided don't reflect the time taken, but shown minimal cars parked on, which is allowed until 12 a.m. Additionally, the capacity chart indicates the plan is working as to the numbers of cars parked, albeit there are always a few defectors, uh, which is an enforcement issue. If the curb is being used to hide nefarious acts, maybe the trees and bushes along the, their property should be trimmed up, allowing that area to be opened up. Uh, property records show that the arms are not new to the city of Mission Viejo, but they lead off with that exaggeration, which then leads one to assume the rest of their representations are also exaggerated. Maybe they should have done their due diligence prior to buying their home on Baronet. Uh, during this time of COVID-19, along with the state stay-at-home orders requiring more people to work from home, uh, work from their homes, 
and self-isolate is hardly a time to put more parking restrictions on the community, if at all. Thank you, a homeowner within the subject community. Uh, next comment. Please do not issue uh, parking on bridge in between uh, Cam between Baronet and Camden Streets in Mission View. Several years ago, the city council was considering opening up parking on the north side of Camden. I informed them of seeing fast food trash, broken booze bottles, and used condoms in, uh, littered on the south side of Camden. And how I see how I stated this would occur on the north side of Camden if you opened up opened it up to parking. Well, you opened it up. Now all of this discarded human trash is on both sides of Camden. If you open up more parking on Baronet, it will have it will have more human trash discarded there. Also, young adults hang out on Camden at night, making a lot of noise. I can hear it, and I live three streets away in Emerald Point uh, town in the Emerald Point townhomes. The city should paint uh, parking spaces along both sides of Camden. This is extremely important, as I've seen uh, trying to tell to parallel park in tight spaces and bump cars. This is just driving by. I've also seen broken car windows and vandalism. Please do not open up parking on Bridgeton. Residential con uh, construction includes uh, two parking spaces. To resolve the parking issue, people need to clean out their junk-filled garages. The city doesn't need to accommodate hoarders of junk in their garages. All right, can move on from there. Uh, I have read the new homeowner's letter regarding the request for parking restrictions. Please enforce the parking rules on all of those streets. I agree that with the new homeowners that this parking situation has caused a lot of fast food containers and other trash to be thrown out on the street. I live in Emerald Point and walk up the hill on Camden and Bridgeton every morning and I see all of the trash and full doggy bags discarded on the streets. I also agree that there should be a trash can and dog waste receptacle installed by the Santa Margarita Water District facility where people are throwing out trash and their full doggy bags. I noticed uh, that three new doggy bag receptacles have been installed up the hill on the green belts and it has helped uh, the doggy bag dumping uh, situation. But more doggy bag trash receptacles need to be installed. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Let's keep our beautiful Mission Viejo clean. Best, Karen Hansen. All right, uh, start the timer here. Uh, to whom it may concern, I have the following comments regarding agenda item number four, parking restrictions on, on Bridgeton between Baronet and Camden. It is my understanding that this agenda item is a proposal to remove the current overnight parking restrictions on the north or non-Canyon side of Bridgeton between Camden and Baronet. Uh, can you please confirm the proposal to remove the parking restriction is limited to this portion of Bridgeton. Uh, can you please confirm what community resident requested the removal of the parking restriction and what the need for removing it is? The restriction was originally implemented due to the excessive noise and garbage that was caused by residents of the Emerald Point and apartment complexes on Camden, parking their vehicles on Bridgeton instead of in the spots allocated to them in their respective residential locations. When cars are parked in that section of Bridgeton during the day and even overnight, despite the restriction, typically as many cars as possible are crammed into that area. The result, this results in the car parked at the corner of Bridgeton and Baronet to extend past the end of the sidewalk. This is a safety hazard as a car parked in that position causes drivers making right turns from Baronet onto Bridgeton to make wide turns into the opposing traffic lane. Given that the Bridgeton Camden curve is a blind curve and cars come uh, come coming around down Camden take that curve at high rates of speed, the possibility of a collision exists. Regardless of whether the overnight parking restriction is removed, uh, it is requested that consideration be given to paint the curb at the end of the sidewalk at the area at, at the Bridgeton Baronet curve with red paint. Thank you for your time. Take care. Um, one comment about this uh, from this resident is 
I spoke to him on the phone after he submitted that comment and clarified that we're actually talking about making a no parking any time restriction and he uh, verbally responded over the phone that that would be something he supports. So it looks like there was a misunderstanding when he made his original public comment on what the intent of this item was. Um, our last comment uh, is again from the homeowners making the original request. Um, it's basically the word for word what the original uh, request was. So uh, I can read it again or we can uh, move on with uh, with the rest of our discussion. Uh, so does the uh, traffic committee have uh, any comments or discussion on this item? Well, I, I'm familiar with this area. This is not far from where I live. And, uh, you know, I agree that they're new homeowners. Uh, this house was had a for sale sign on it three weeks ago. You know, so they these are extremely new homeowners and i don't know if they put a date on there but they're it's super extreme you know they're brand new uh and a lot of that stuff i i do feel there's a huge amount of exaggeration in their uh this is my opinion they're in their letter i don't feel it's 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 as bad as uh they're saying they haven't been there long enough to get a feel of it uh i feel we shouldn't make any changes but I do feel that if we have restrictions and we're not enforcing it, that that's that's something we need to do. If we have restrictions and people are, you know, just not paying attention to it, uh, that does fall on us. And I think that's the first thing we should do is is enforce it. I mean, that could clear up, uh, you know, a lot of the of the parts of their letter, you know, just by enforcing what we've already tried, you know, a, a few years back. So that's the way I feel. Thank you. Uh, I agree with Commissioner Lackness. Uh, my only uh, added thought, and this is probably out of our jurisdiction, is if they're new homeowners, um, they may want to talk to their realtor, you know, and, and, and find out uh, if there was a previous nuisance issue here and why weren't they informed of it. But again, that's outside our jurisdiction, but that would be what I would be asking, you know, if, if there's something that egregious where you actually have to change the environment, um, that would be a, a concern. But uh, I'm with Commissioner Lechness otherwise and just keeping it the way it is. Okay, uh, and then uh, I'm sure uh, Deputy Coleman might have something to say about uh, the enforcement out there uh, and coordinating um, uh, renewal of those efforts to uh, do the overnight enforcement out there? Yes, yeah. I, I'm not sure if they've already called or inquired about, you know, um, certain car cars that look like they're doing nefarious acts um, to have a deputy go out and check on that car. Um, more often than not, especially for this area, these cars that are coming to leave trash or do these nefarious acts, they don't typically live in the area. Um, they're just getting off the main road to go down to a secluded area that's next to a hillside and backs up to some apartments. Um, we have one um, community service officers that enforces traffic during nighttime hours, and we have two um, assigned every day uh, throughout the week. Um, again, if you see something, you should say something and call us. You know, we, we're more than happy to come and enforce any issues, or especially somebody breaking the law or doing any sort of, you know, nefarious acts or littering those are all enforceable things that they mentioned inside the um, original complaint that we can make a big deal about um, they can also send a uh, request to the city or the uh, saddleback substation to uh, have daily patrol checks there at nighttime if this type of actions happen at nighttime um, they can schedule you know weekly or daily patrol checks where a deputy is going to go out there and actually patrol the neighborhood area of the said problems. All right, so um, so our action item then will be that the, the parking restrictions are to be left as is and um, and that any 
any reports of uh, this kind of activity going on should be reported to the sheriff's department and I can respond to the residents with the appropriate uh, dispatch number then. All right. So if there's no other comments, I can uh, move us on to item number five, which is the uh, request from our previous meeting. It's a review of collision history at Alicia Parkway and Geronimo Road. And that will be presented by Philip as soon as I stop sharing my screen. Okay, can you guys hear me? All right. We hear you now. So here is uh, a request from Commissioner Lechness from last meeting. He wanted us to review the collision history at Alicia Parkway and Geronimo Road. So I made some exhibits and some statistical uh, evaluations for the collision history. Um, but before we go into the collision history, I wanted to give some background on the intersection. So this is our vicinity map. We have Alicia Parkway and Geronimo. It's like right in the middle of the, the photo. Uh, about 550 feet to the east of that intersection is another intersection is Via Fabricante and Alicia Parkway. So I just want to clarify that there's a closely spaced intersection nearby. So it does cause some challenges from a traffic signal timing standpoint. Um, Alicia Parkway, the speed limit's 45 miles per hour on both sides of the intersection. And then for Geronimo Road, it's the same thing. It's about 45 miles an hour on each side. Uh, this intersection is challenging because there's horizontal curves coming into this intersection uh, from each of the four directions, uh, two on Alicia and two on Geronimo, as you can see on this map. And there's also the close spacing for signals. So I wanted to show that really quick. Go to the next intersection. Uh, this is a zoomed in version of the intersection. So you get a, a closer look of what it looks like. Uh, on the each corner, um, there's a gas station in one corner. There's the retail center, the gateway center in another corner. There's a lot of foot traffic there. There's the residential side on the other corner. Uh, there's not an immediate entrance there, but uh, that's what's backing the corner. And then on the northeast side, there's the High Park Business Center. Um, on this exhibit, uh, we did take traffic counts in January of 2020, so that was about 10 months ago. And that was before uh, COVID shut down a lot of intersections, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of businesses and implemented the stay at home order. So these are, um, I would say, normal traffic condition patterns. So to the east of Alicia Parkway, there's about 41,000 cars a day. And then north of Geronimo, there's about 16,700 cars per day. South of Geronimo, it's about 16,000 cars a day. So they're about the same on both legs of Geronimo. The west leg of Alicia Parkway is about 59,600 cars a day. This is the highest traffic volume leg. As you can see, a lot of the traffic volumes are heading in this direction. I think they're trying to get onto the freeway. So that's why there's a high traffic volume there. And then this is our street view exhibit. Uh, when you're looking west, oh, actually, you know what? I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back one exhibit. I wanted to make something clear. You could see the marked crosswalk on each leg of this intersection. Um, the west leg right here, we did remove this crosswalk a couple of years ago to improve the signal timing operations. Uh, by removing that crosswalk, we did reduce the number of pedestrian conflicts at this intersection. So I wanted to clarify that uh, from a safety standpoint, less pedestrians crossing here. So that means less pedestrian vehicle interactions. Okay, so now we're going to our street view photo. This is going westbound on Alicia Parkway towards the freeway. You can see there's two left turns, three through lanes and the right turn lane. So it's a big intersection. Uh, if you look past this intersection, there's Via Fabricante ahead. It's about 500 feet up, uh, but that's uh, along the, the path. So I wanted to make a note of that. And then this intersection on the bottom is if you're heading the opposite direction is eastbound Alicia. 
There's two left turn lanes, three through lanes, and a right turn. Again, we eliminated the marked crosswalk on this intersection. So I wanted to emphasize that as well. Then this photo is if you're going northbound on Geronimo, it's a two left turns, two throughs, and one right turn lane. Uh, right here where the center line striping stops, there's the driveway to get into the gateway center. There's some traffic there as well. And then this bottom photo, oh, sorry about that, here you go. The bottom photo is if you're coming from the opposite direction of Geronimo Road, uh, there's two left turns, two throughs, and a right turn lane. So uh, what I was trying to make a point was that it's a big intersection no matter which direction you're coming from. There's dual lefts, at least two throughs, two or three throughs, and a dedicated right turn lane. Uh, this exhibit is just our intersection turning movement counts. Uh, this was done in 2016. It's a bit of an older exhibit, but it, I was trying to emphasize the number of volumes making a left and a right turn. Uh, they're really high. So northbound Geronimo, there's about 600 cars in the morning making that left turn to go uh, west on the freeway onto the ramps. And then, you know, on eastbound and westbound Alicia Parkway, there's 1,100 eastbound through and then 1,700 cars going westbound. So that, those are just examples, but they're really high volumes. So there's a heavy intersection. And then um, the bottom part of this exhibit right here, it shows the pedestrian and bicycle crossings. Uh, there's not a lot of bikes and peds there, but there are some. It ranges from 0 to 13 per hour. Um, this exhibit just shows the traffic volumes again. Um, it just displays it in a different format in the left turns and right turns. Again, very heavy movements uh, in all directions. Okay. So now this is our uh, collision diagram. So we typically review collisions for three years. So I, I made one diagram for each year, which is 2017, 2018, and 2019. Uh, we don't have recent 2020 data yet. So this is our most recent collision data for 2019. So Geronimo is the north and south street. Alicia is the east and west street. As you can see on here, for 2019, there were five reported collisions. There were two of them, which are injury collisions. So the injury, there's a little X inside the circle. That means injury. And then three uh, property damage collisions, which is just uh, vehicle damage, but the drivers were not injured. So we have three of those. As you can see on here, uh, there are various collisions at different locations. Uh, this is looks like a rear end, rear end hit and run. These are hit and runs in different directions. Uh, the only common ones here is at the intersection and, and it says ran red light. So there's two of them. Um, typically we use five as a pattern. If it happens five times, it's considered a pattern and they have to be going in the same direction. Uh, the, these two collisions at the intersection were occurring at different directions. One's a southbound and westbound. The other one's a southbound left. And then uh, I think that's a, someone was making a left and went right. So I, I wrote some comments on here that shows the average daily traffic in 2019 on the first sentence. You know, they're very similar to the traffic that I showed for 2020. And then, um, there are two broadside collisions occurring at the intersections due to red, li red light violations. We suggest enforcement in the westbound direction of Alicia Parkway and continue to monitor it. There are two other hit and run collisions with unknown primary collision factors at different directions away from the intersection and then one DUI collision occurring on the south leg. So the south leg had a DUI. So that was 2019. Uh, we're going to go to, this is 2018 now. So this is the location of the collisions. In 2018, we had a total of seven reported collisions, 
four of them were injury collisions, three which were property. Uh, again, there's a cluster occurring uh, at the intersection. It appears to be coming from the westbound direction. And uh, there was one on the north leg, one on the west leg. And um, again, at the bottom, I wrote some comments about the average daily traffic for 2018. And then the evaluation for the collision. Um, there are three red light violations occurring in the westbound Alicia Parkway direction that resulted in broadside collisions at the intersection. We recommend enforcement in the westbound approach of Alicia Parkway and continue to monitor it. The other collisions appear to be random incidents, uh, red light violation in the southbound, and a DUI going northbound, hit and run westbound, and there is one wrong way collision. That was 2018. Now this is 2017 uh, intersection collision diagram. Um, in 2017, there were 16 reported collisions. Um, there were 11 of them which were injury collisions and five which were property damage. Um, there is a cluster at the intersection, uh, but there's they're going in every direction almost. And then there's some occurring on the west leg of the intersection. And then uh, the square on the bottom right here, that, that means it, they hit an object and there was a injury, a personal injury. So when you look at the comments section, again, I talk about the average daily traffic back in 2017. And then from the collision standpoint, there is a pattern of five broadside collisions occurring from different directions at the intersection due to red light running violations. We suggest enforcement and continue to monitor. There is a pattern of four collisions in the east-west direction based on unsafe speeding. Uh, we suggest a speed radar trailer and spot police enforcement and continue to monitor it. Various random other collisions without patterns. So that shows the exhibits uh, on a graphical illustration purpose. Uh, I made a table, so we look at it from a numerical standpoint. So in 2019, there were five collisions. 2018, there were seven. 2017, there were 16. So we're trending in the correct direction. It's getting less and less each year. Here's the primary collision factors, which is the formal California vehicle code. Um, there's Some of them are unknown. And then here's a description of what the primary collision factor was. Some of them are red light running violations, driving under the influence, unsafe lane change, unsafe speed, traveling in the opposite direction, and failure to yield the right of way. And then here's the collision types. Uh, there's broadsides and rear ends, and there's also a hit object and there's an auto and ped collision on here and a head-on collision. Then when you look at the lighting, when, when did the collision occur? Uh, it, it's about a 50-50 split, I would say. Um, half occurs during the daytime, half occurs during the nighttime. That's that column. Then the next column, it, did it involve pedestrians or bicyclists? There was one collision that had a pedestrian involved. So that's the table uh, from a numerical standpoint. And then this, just wanted to summarize the mitigation measures that we've routinely concluded or conducted at the intersection. You know, we traditionally check for signal timing, the yellow clearance interval and red clearance interval timing. Um, we also maintain the safety lights and the signal indications that's uh, checked once a month by our signal technician. Uh, we maintain the speed limits, uh, signal ahead signs and pavement markings. That's on a routine basis as well. Um, we've continued to monitor and review the collision history. Um, we get uh, a copy of every reported collision in the city. So we have that on file. 
And then uh, we uh, also have recommended spot police enforcement, speeding and red light running violations in the past. Um, we've you know, deployed the speed radar trailers when available. And then we've also, uh, I know that the deputies, they administer DUI checkpoints along Alicia Parkway. I don't know exactly where, but I know they've, they've done that before. Um, some future action items to consider. Again, we'll continue to monitor the, and evaluate the collision history. And then we'll also consider recommending spot police enforcement for speeding and red light running violations. Uh, we'll continue to ask to deploy the speed radar trailers and administer DUI checkpoints. And then if there is uh, an opportunity to construct speed feedback signs, we could do that as well. So that's basically the conclusion of the collision review at Alicia Parkway in Geronimo. And I'll open it up for any questions that you guys have. Philip, I love it. Great uh, presentation. Great. Stop it right there. Stop right there. Uh, great uh, data. You know, this is exactly what I was hoping for, where you could kind of get, you know, a look at what's going on at this intersection. And like you said, 16 and uh, 2017 and 7, and it's, it's, we're going the right direction. You know, hopefully this year it's, uh, you know, it'll be even be better. But now, once you have all this data, okay, now's the time where we take that data and we go, okay, here's what we've come down to. Now with all this data, we've realized that, and I'm making this part up, but this is what the next step is. I mean, you've got everything, but the next step I feel should be saying, okay, we had, we're, we're gonna take those three years and we've had all this stuff. We're gonna take the three years and say, what we've come up with is daytime is when most accidents are happening. Most accidents are coming from the south, or, or you know, I'm making this up because I don't know what the answer is, but most accidents are people traveling uh, west on Alicia. Uh, most of the accidents, or half of them, are are because they're turning from Geronimo onto, I, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but now we have this information, we should, really you know dissect it and go this is where the problem is our problem and let's say we had all that information uh now we could go our problem is people are driving you know 80 percent of our accidents are people on alicia you know it, it uh at four o'clock in the afternoon you know get trying to get home or you know most of our accidents are at uh, eight in the morning people turning from geronimo onto alicia trying to beat that 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 uh, light to get to the freeway but i love everything i think this is excellent I, I love it and i think that we do have one small little step to go and that is to really break down where all this is happening you know where the the issue is and then once we had that then we can tell you know deputy coleman say okay look this what do you think of this you know th this is all happening at at eight in the morning, you know, or or four in the afternoon, or whatever it is, I love it. I think it's it's uh, exactly what we want. Um, one question to you is: Do we know if this is the uh, again? We before we've said it's the most dangerous intersection of Mission Viejo. Have we done this to any others where we go, or this one is so obvious? This is the one we should focus on, or are there others that have such? Uh, you know, big numbers, even though I don't, to me, I don't think seven in a year, to me, that doesn't sound like a big deal. It seems like every intersection is going to have seven. So maybe this intersection is not as bad as, uh, uh, as we once thought, you know? So anyways, uh, I love what you've done here and thank you. I know you did it because I requested it. I love it. It would be nice if we could take it to the next level, but maybe we're on the right track. Maybe things we're doing in 2020, we're going to have five accidents and, and it's a, like a hoorah. So I love everything that you've done. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'll just uh, comment really quickly. Um, we do uh, receive every reported collision in the city and we do uh, an annual collision analysis for the city. Um, so this intersection 
back in 2017, it did have a high number of collisions. And I think that's why it made it on the paper uh, for that one year. But as you can see, we're, we've been trending downward since that time. Uh, we continue to monitor the intersection and we can, we can continue our evaluation. But this is a, a routine thing that we do in the city, myself and Brett also. You know, the, the collision reports actually go directly to Brett's office. And then uh, we, you know, at the end of each year, we do a collision analysis. Um, usually the trend is the more traffic you have, the more collisions you have. So for the locations or the arterials, the Alicia Parkways, the Crown Valley Parkway, Oso Parkway, Santa Margarita Parkway, all of those big collectors, or I'm sorry, big arterials, they carry a lot of traffic volume. So when you have more traffic, you're, you tend to have more collisions. That's just the trend. Um, we're, we're reviewing the collisions, not just, you know, at this time of day and day of the week. We, there's an anecdote uh, from the witnesses and for the people involved in the collisions on each part, and we could read it and the, we can understand what they were thinking. You know, I didn't see the car coming because there was a tree in the way or, you know, the, the sun was in the way and I couldn't see the signal indication. So we, we have the opportunity to read that and we review that as well. And then you're, you're correct when we get a trend that we we think we can stop. You know, there's a lot of speeding going in the westbound direction. We, we share our safety collision analysis with the deputies and we ask them to, you know, do spot and in police enforcement at that time, if they can do that or deploy the speed radar trailers out there. You know, those are things we can consider. From a traffic engineering standpoint, um, when we hear they ran the red light, so we check our, our yellow time, was that adequate? Did we have enough red time on the signal? You know, we can review those portions of the signal. We're in control of that part. So that's the engineering part that we can take care of. Um, as far as the other locations in the city, Alicia Parkway, unfortunately, because it carries so much volume, Alicia Parkway is usually the first or the second highest traffic uh, traveled arterial in the city. So our highest collision locations are usually on Alicia Parkway or Crown Valley. It's one or the other. They flip flop each year, you know. Um, this year in 2020, I I am hoping there's going to be a lot less collisions uh, because of the stay at home orders. <laughs> Just in general, there's going to be less traffic on the roadway. And so less traffic means less collisions. Hopefully that's the trend that we're we're hoping for. Um, I, I but, got one more question before Cameron come, comes on. Uh, you said um, that uh, you mentioned yellow light and red light timing and all that. Uh, did we, were there significant changes or any changes after 2017 that, you, you know, the large number of uh, accidents there? Did we implement anything that, that we could say, wow, this really is why 2018 was so good and 2019 is getting you know, was great and 2020 might even be better. Was there something we did uh, after 2017? Um, off the top of my head, I don't recall that we did anything significantly different. I know in 2017, we were due for our citywide uh, speed limit survey update. So we did that in 2017 and the speed limit on the roadway on Alicia Parkway didn't change. It was still 45 miles an hour. Uh, the reason why I bring that up is because the speed limit of the roadway is a function of the yellow time for the signals. So the yellow time ranges from three to six seconds, and that's based on the speed of the roadway. But again, in 2017, the speed of the roadway on Alicia did not change. So the yellow stayed, you know, it didn't, it didn't change at all. But uh, off the top of my head, I don't recall any major changes that we've done. Uh, Brett, do you recall any anything? Yep. yep. Um, no, so a little over a year ago, um, as a result from our continuous monitoring of this location through the annual uh, citywide collision analysis that Philip and I work on, um, we had an opportunity to install enforcement lights, which are those little tiny red lights that you can mount on the backside of a signal head, and that enables the motor deputies to go out there and do red light enforcement while waiting from a safe location. And Alicia and Geronimo was one of four intersections that we identified as a location where we could improve safety out there by improving our red light enforcement. 
And so those were installed, uh, I believe, March or so of last year. And uh, as you can see, the the trend in collisions has been downward. So uh, I really hope that those are uh, you know related things that the installation of the enforcement lights and, and then matching that with the increased enforcement from our deputies uh, has helped to result in the lowering of the collision rates to what we have now. Okay. All right. Um, Commissioner Nauer Hayes, did you have any comments? Uh, no, great report. Uh, Brett just actually answered one of my first uh, questions about the, I call them cheater boxes, those little enforcement boxes that go on the back of the lights. Yeah, uh, we, we call them rat lights, but I think the appropriate <laughs> term is enforcement light. Yeah, uh, so I, I mean, that's, that's great that we have those. And hopefully, but hopefully there's a causation there, right? Hopefully there's, there's citations actually being written uh, for that. Um, you know, I also want to, you know, point out for the, you know, by chance somebody is actually listening to this or reading this, you know, there's a real difference between calling these collisions and accidents, you know. Um, every one of these crashes is an intentional act. You know, running a red light's no accident. Someone made a conscious decision to run red light. They intentionally went through that late yellow. They gunned it. That's why they're bad accidents, because people always gun it and they speed up. There's lots of damage. So, you know, am I confident things, uh, you know, can get better? No, I mean, we're dealing with human behavior here. Enforcement is one of the best ways to deal with those red light violators. And I really hope that that happens. Um, you know, the only other um, thing that I've seen at some intersections, and I don't, I don't know if there's any science behind it, and maybe Philip and, and Brett in your realm, the distinctive crosswalks and some of the cities are doing more writing on the ground, more, um, I don't know, more displays of, of signage, but built into the pavement where citizens are looking down at that, colored intersections, uh, things of that nature. Uh, has that ever been explored? Um, actually, our, uh... Our director of public works has uh, shifted away from pavement markings, and we've we've been trying to implement more signage in lieu of pavement markings because of the maintenance costs. When you have uh -huh. when you have pavement markings, you have to maintain it. I think it's either a year or or eighteen months, so we have to repaint it every time. Whereas a signage that's posted on the side of the road, you construct it. And it's there until it gets hit. You know, there's no maintenance costs. So you're correct. There are some, you know, the traditional engineering pavement markings, such as signal ahead, we have uh, been removing that when we, we resurfaced the roadway and we've replaced it with signage that says signal ahead as a signage instead of a pavement marking. So for our city, um, we're, we're trending in that direction because of maintenance costs. Um, I have not seen, uh, a, a decorated uh, pavement marking within Mission Viejo, and and I don't. I also don't know if what that impact would be in regards to collision, collision safety improvement. So um, yeah, it might, be, to... might be something for discussion, or or maybe there's there's some science behind that. Where if we have, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, this is a nucleus of a problem here. I understand saving money and the signage and everything, but. Uh, Someone somewhere came up with this to to respond to a problem, and I'm I'm wondering if there is um, some sort of science behind making people look to the ground or giving them something to look at at the ground versus signs, because this is such a complicated overhead you have in front of us. That is a complicated intersection with turn lanes and, and going straight and everything else. I mean, that's a real anomaly that intersection. Um, and if you're visiting or, or doing whatever, or you're a brand new driver, I mean, that is just a wacky intersection. And you look at places like yeah. Beach Boulevard that are eight lanes yeah. across, yeah. have less accidents than this intersection. A Beach Boulevard, a state highway, um, yeah. and a lot more volume. Um, so I, it might just be something for conversation or maybe uh, reach out to one of your association members 
and um, and ask them, hey, if you're a city that's using this, why are you using it? Why'd you buy it? I'd love to hear that sales pitch. I'd love to hear if there was something behind it. Sure, and, no problem. And, and otherwise, take a look into uh, it. Yeah, otherwise that's all I I have. Again, it, it looks like we're going in the the right direction, but um, you know, happy enforcement, Station Eighteen. All right. Okay. Did anybody else have any other comments? Uh, I just want to know what the official action item for us uh, to include in the minutes is going to be. Uh, as an action item, I would say receive and file. And then uh, you can include the commentary from, from everyone. Okay. Um, yeah, I was just curious uh, because uh, Commissioner Lechness had talked about, okay, going to the next step. So I, I was wondering if there was any more to that uh, commentary on what we should include in our action item. Okay, it wouldn't be a bad idea to take it to the next level. I mean, you don't have to do it right away, but you know, give a give a if you don't want to do it, give it to a volunteer to do it, an intern. <laughs> but we don't have volunteers. We don't have interns. It's me and Philip. Uh, <laughs> so, what would you right. like us to do, and when I do think, you want it? Listen, I think it would be great if you could at the next meeting you could go. You know what? We took all this data, and you may be happy to know, commissioners, that 80% of the accidents from the last three years are from, from uh, or, or I liked what uh, Cameron said, 80% of the activity that caused problems, well, they weren't accidents. These were people making a conscious choice to zip around somebody or, or blow through the intersection or try to make the light. Or... You go, hey, 80% of the accidents were just full-on accidents. You know, someone installed in the front, you know, crossing the intersection. Well, you know what I mean. It'd be nice to take that information and really zero it down on, on what the problem is there. And like I said, maybe it's all on Alicia Parkway. All these, maybe a huge percentage is just from people on Alicia or Geronimo. It'd be nice to know. It's not, you know, if you, you got other stuff going on, you know, it doesn't matter, but it'd be nice to know. I'll leave it at that. Do what you want to do. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we will come back with any findings if we do further analysis on the data. All right. Okay, uh, Deputy Coleman, did you have any other last comments on this, or are you ready for us to move on to updates? No, I can just assure you guys that the enforcement has been heavily increased, um, both uh, eastbound and westbound Alicia at that particular area um, are being heavily enforced. I personally wrote five sites today, um, partner Deputy Vago is going to be working it in about 15 minutes, and he'll get another handful of sites there. It just seems like a street that we're, we're citing a ton of people and I've personally seen the speed start to slow down because they know where we're sitting. So if either they're approaching Geronimo and they're going to be a sitting at Via Linda, so they're like, oh shoot, I need to slow down and it'll create a, you know, a slower flow of traffic through Geronimo. Or as they're coming through up the city, if we're sitting at Poe, they're going to see us there and get used to, oh shoot, wait, I need to check this spot first. Maybe there's a motor sitting there. And so I've noticed the citations we're issuing are slowing down because people are starting to look for us at those particular areas, which makes them ultimately slow down. So okay. I think it'll be, uh, be better. <laughs> hey, Deputy, quick question for you. Uh, I don't know how your traffic unit works. Uh, on the DUI crashes, when those are reviewed, is there enough chatter in your bureau to go, hey, our, our last two or three crashes people were coming from this location. You guys actually try to figure out where people are drinking at, just in case we have a saturation issue around there. I know from the planning commission aspect, we've looked at that area before, and there's a few bars there, there's people serving alcohol. Do you guys look at those reports like that? Oh, it, it's all based off the handling company. In the report or part of the narrative, they have to cover that part of the actual DUI form that we fill out. It covers, hey, you 
know, what are your current medical conditions? You know, trying to eliminate every possible excuse as to why you're driving is, you know, poor or led to this accident. And one of the questions they ask is, where did you start drinking from or where, where were you drinking? Where were you driving from? Where were you planning on going? So we have, you know, as long as the person we're asking is giving an honest answer, we have some sort of an idea. But the only way to actually find that information for any of the DUI arrests, you'd actually have to review the actual DUI report. Okay. Okay, might, might just be something else for chatter in the bureau there. You know, hey guys, if you notice a trend of, of a certain, um, you know, on sale uh, liquor establishment or whatever. Um, I know that happens from time to time. You start getting a lot of deuces out of one one bar on Friday nights causing crashes. So as long as you guys have that chatter, uh, just another idea to spitball and uh, keep up the good work. All right, uh, then uh, we can move on to updates if there are uh, there are anything that the committee would like an update on um, or I, I have one uh, last update about our uh, project we've had going on down at our train station if you guys are interested in that. Okay, so uh, as you know, we've had the construction going on just south of our train station that's going to add, uh, I think it's 1.8 miles of new double track to improve the railroad operations in that area. Uh, that new track went into service this uh, over the weekend. So this morning was uh, the first time that they've had uh, a complete set of uh, double tracks south of our station for that next 1.8 miles. So uh, the remaining items are expected to be complete by the end of the year, but otherwise uh, they're, they're up and running there now. So uh, we have some progress on that. And that's it for my updates. Um, I, I don't have any additional updates to share with you guys, so that's it for me. All right, then if there are no other additional comments, we can call this meeting adjourned at 437. Hey, Brett, do you want to just talk about next meeting date? Oh. Uh, just to confirm that everyone's available. Uh, yeah, hold on. My other computer here logged out, so I got to get back in to look at the calendar. Hey, Philip, while he's uh, doing that, any chatter about uh, live meetings? Oh, you mean in, in person meetings? In person. Um, you know, I, I haven't heard any updates. I think we're still just going by the CDC guidelines. Mm -hmm. So whatever their recommendation is, that's what we're following. Um, I think city council's operating the same way and you guys are participating in the planning and transportation commission meetings as well. So, um, I think we're taking our traffic committee. We're basing our a meeting format based on city council. So once city council starts meeting in person, uh, we'll, we'll follow suit and do the same. So that's that's kind of where we're at right now, but I haven't had any, I haven't heard any rumblings or updates of when we're gonna change back to a in-person meeting. Okay, thank you. All right, and on that note, our next virtual meeting is scheduled for Monday, November 16th. Thank you. All right, everybody. So All right. we'll receive your agendas about a week before then. All right. Happy Halloween, everybody. All right. Happy okay. Halloween. Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you guys later. Thank All you. right. Thank you, everyone. Bye. All right, um, Mark, if you're still on here, is it okay to shut off the meeting? Or